All right, thank you everyone for joining us today on this Thursday, again, day of the week statement, Thursday in May. We've made it all the way to May together. Thank you for those of us who've joined us all the way through this journey. And for those of us joining for the first time today, welcome. We are the Broadway Green Alliance and these are our green quarantine sessions. Uh, and it's such a treat to be here with you today. Um, it's uh, sunny here in Philadelphia, how appropriate, and I hope it's nice wherever you guys are in the world. It's talking uh, with Florida at the beginning, so nice uh, to talk to you. Where are you? There you are, you're off. Brandy, nice to talk with you, Brandy. Um, excited to potentially start a chapter down in Florida. Brandy and I are going to get started. I know we've got other chapters on here, Atlanta and Chicago as always. So perhaps we'll all gather together and convince Brandy to get going. Um, but without further ado, I'm very excited to um, welcome our speaker today. We have the incredible Jennifer Kahn, who single-handedly founded and started Scenery. Am I correct? It's scenery, not scenery bags now? Yeah, technically, it's scenery, but scenery, scenery bags for websites. So Excellent. You roll scenery. It. Um, and Jennifer will explain exactly what scenery does, scenery bags, and how fantastic it is, and what we can all learn from the incredible endeavor that scenery is. Um, and the exciting launch of a new necklace today. If you guys haven't seen it, you'll definitely ah, model there. <laughs> um, Jennifer began her career as a stage manager and has stage managed countless Broadway shows. So she'll be able to talk a little bit that, about that as well, which will be a preview for our upcoming seminar at lesson in two weeks, uh, which will be all about sustainable stage management. So I will turn it over to you, Jennifer, and let you take it away. Uh, awesome. For those of you, again, everyone I'm sure is familiar with Zoom at this point, but you can pin uh, Jennifer's uh, screens so that you can just see her nice and big and throw all questions in the chat, and I will field those as they go, holding most of them until the end. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you, Molly, and thank you for having me. Um, I am a huge fan of Broadway Green Alliance, have been um, since like the very beginning. So I am thrilled to be here and um, to be asked to be part of this. Uh, what you guys do is so important, and as, a stage manager, I actually, I worked mostly regionally and I only did one Broadway show, so it is not countless, it is only one, but I love being part of the Broadway community. I actually really had no plan of working on Broadway. My story to like the Broadway stage was not norm. I was happily working in San Diego, which is where I was from. I stage managed for the Hoya Playhouse and the Old Globe for eight years would spend my days sailing and playing beach volleyball and then going to do a show and really was like, fine with that. Um, and then my husband got into Columbia and that brought me east and then I was lucky enough to get to work on Broadway before I had a baby and started scenery bags. Um, so that's like my very small version of my stage management story, but I'm happy to field any stage managing questions. Um, but I, I loved it and I was, I would, always, not always, but a lot of times repurpose things from my shows anyway, like make people necklaces out of props that we, like we had like bullet casing from a prop gun and I like made people jewelry during one of the shows I worked on. Like that was kind of like well, already in my wheelhouse. And um, for about four years, my sister and I ran a blog on give back and ethical style. So there was my stage management side and then there was this like give back and ethical style side that I really thought would never have anything to do with each other and then I had the idea for scenery bags and it kind of like married these two halves of myself in this company that I so believe in um so then all of my life made sense all of a sudden I was like oh this is where I was supposed to be I understand now um and so what we do at scenery bags or scenery um is we collect theatrical waste Everything that we have um, would have ended up in a landfill. I'm actually really, really careful in talking with gyms and producers and um, shop heads that if there is life for this drop that it is used elsewhere um, or donated to, um, you know, any kind of, if there are nonprofits um, like Materials for the Arts in New York, that kind of thing. Um, try sometimes I'll like broker transitions for drops that still have life. and um, 
but if they're not, if they kind of don't have the bandwidth, which is maybe something we can talk about is, I think, something that theater, regional theaters face, um, and probably now and moving forward more than ever, is just having the bandwidth to repurpose, which is why a lot of stuff comes to us, um, is that even if there is a life for something, it oftentimes ends up in a landfill anyway, um, just because trying to find the right match for it uh, is a real challenge. Um, and so, but we started with 600 pounds of um, drops from a friend of mine who rents shows in San Diego. And um, it sat in my parents' storage unit for like two years while I was still stage managing and they thought they'd never get rid of it ever, I'm sure, because um, I like starting companies <laughs> all the time. And uh, then I had my son and it ironically afforded me the time at home to kind of kick this project down the road enough to get like a sample batch out. And, um, and so I found a manufacturer in LA. She made a test group of like 25 bags that I sold on Instagram. They sold out in 24 hours. And um, Chris Rodriguez, who I did Spring Awakening Revival with, she was like, a, she's always been a huge supporter of scenery bags. So she got one right away. She posted about it. We got a lot of attention from that. Um, Rachel Bloom was a good friend of hers who then contacted us and um, wanted a bag. And so we got one to her and then we got like 4,000 new followers. And I started, a, I made a website for us like while I was breastfeeding my three month old, like in an afternoon, built a website on Wix just to get like a landing page up. And we had like the 200 waiting list. Um, and then Upworthy did a feature on us. And so we launched in July of 2017 and August 1st of 2017, um, up where they did a feature that went viral that Broadway World picked up and theirs went viral as well. So we had, we sold 4,000 bags in 48 hours. Um, and then my like cute little side project turned into a full-time real life project, um, which has been, like I said, I accidentally started my dream job that I, um, ev like everything I care about as far as I, I love theater. I loved working in theater. Uh, this company is supposed to be a, a love letter to theater. And if we're not doing that, then we're doing something wrong. But the one thing that made me really sad about our industry is how wasteful it is, which I know I'm preaching to the choir with you guys. Um, but I was like, how can we help? How can we help that part of the equation? Um, and then the other thing that's always been a big part of my heart is accessibility. And so a percentage of every purchase goes to TDF, the actual theater development fund in New York to take kids to see theater. Um, and so, yeah, we're almost three years in and we've collected over 26,000 pounds of theatrical waste and we've taken almost 800 kids to see a Broadway show. And here we are. And now we repurpose show decks. So what started as like, you know, I drops seemed like an easy fit. That was something, it was just like a plain piece of fabric. It's often thrown away. Um, you know, we had to do a lot of research and development as far as like the cleaning process and everything that comes to us is we sometimes a little bit different. Um, and so that was like one of the bigger steps in using drops that we had to work out first. Um, but now I just, anytime anyone offers us anything, I say yes, because I just don't ever want anything to go into a landfill if we think it's usable. Um, so that's been the, been my big thing is you know someone offered us show decks so now we're making jewelry necklaces and bangles people offered us scraps of marley a lot of off cuts of marley that um aren't a usable size for a company to use um we've made earrings out of that we have some other things planned we use billboards marketing material now step and repeats really like anything that has touched the broadway world or theater world that would end up in a trash can. We're really, if someone offers us something, I feel an onus to repurpose it and onus to make it work. So um, it's fun to get to be creative and, um, you know, and, and we're figuring it out. So it's really, it's evolved so much bigger than I ever thought it would be. And I'm really, really grateful for the support we've gotten from the theater community to kind of make it all happen. Any questions? <laughs> Great. Uh, yes, we have some questions. Uh, 
Mara, do you want to ask your question? Hi, sorry. Hi. So I'm wondering, and my question kind of bleeds over into Cassandra's too. We're wondering, um, do you have a giant storage facility somewhere? And then are you, and Cassandra said manufacturing and shop space, or do you outsource all the manufacturing to others? We, um, I don't make anything. You would not want a bag that I made. Um, it would not turn out well. Um, but we have, everything's made in America. Our, all of our bags are made in Florida uh, at a manu manufacturing shop in Florida. And they, they receive all the drops there. Um, they have a giant warehouse space and we have two storage units that are down the street. Um, and there we have two full storage units right now of drops that we haven't gotten to yet. Um, and so all that to say, you know, for, for theaters who are trying to figure out if there's a, a way to repurpose some of the stuff that they'd be retiring, you all have a costume shop, you, you know, like people, you, theaters can do this as well and put it in there, you know, sell it to, give it to donors, sell it in, in their merch. Um, there's certainly more than enough theatrical waste to go around. There's nothing proprietary about what I'm doing. And, um, but we have thankfully a lot of space there. And then the, um, the shop that makes our, all of our stuff out of show deck is in North Carolina and they're actually an IOTC shop. Um, they're a union uh, shop that builds sets for national tours. So it's, you know, ironically, I have all these, um, set build IOTC um, carpenters making jewelry for me, but they're doing a great job. Um, amazing. Yeah. So, but like, they're so game to try, which is really awesome. And they're equally as excited about not throwing this stuff away. And they, so they'll talk to me all the time. They're like, we have a bunch of, we just did a, sh a load, a, a load out, or we just built a show and we have X, Y, Z scrap. What can you make? And then we just kind of go to the drawing board and say, all right, maybe let's try this or this. Um, we started, we actually started with coasters is what they like pitched me first. Um, and you would think that would be really easy, but after like the cutting and the sanding and the coating, uh, it would ha have to, we'd have to charge like $40 a coaster. And I'm like, well, that's not gonna work. But jewelry actually, because the pricing works out a little bit differently, all of those steps were easier to absorb into like a jewelry piece. Um, and so we started with bangles and now, and then we did earrings and now we have necklace. Um, you know, we're looking into like a home goods side and scenery home, maybe something <laughs> in our future, um, just to try to get some, some larger pieces out there. Um, again, like with the onus of trying to use everything that comes to us, um, making some, some things that are bigger might be helpful. Um, so when people call you and say, like, we have a billboard or something, do you just decide this is going to Florida or this is going to North Carolina right at that moment? Yeah, yeah. And then we have um, a freight carrier who I actually got through, because I was shipping everything through UPS freight at first. Um, and this is kind of like in the weeds information that I'm not sure is interesting. But um, I, we got Lion King drops from Disney uh, and their LTL carrier ended up doing it. And now I only use her. So I got her, I stole her from Disney. I didn't steal her. They still have her, but she's amazing. And I love her. But so we, we pay for all shipping, which is also advantageous to, you know, theater, theater companies all over the country. If, you know, anyone says they have something for us, we try to make it as easy on them as possible. So that someone emails me and says, we just cleared out our warehouse. We've offered, you know, we have, a month for nearby nonprofits and schools to go through our inventory, whatever's left over, do you want it? And I'm like, yep, sure, I'll send you a pallet, I'll pick it up, and then and then we sift through it when it shows up in Florida. And I, I like sometimes right now I've been FaceTiming and they're and just they'll show me like what it is. Because things show up sight unseen. We got a pallet from Troika the other day of stuff that I had no idea what was coming. So we're like, okay. Let's just like dig through and see what's here and see, you know, how we can use it and just try to kind of like figure it out. Which is why we started tote bags. Tote bags was a kind of an answer to the, these unnamed things coming our way because our customer base doesn't really 
want to buy anything that's not from a named show, um, which is understandable if they want it as like a keepsake. Um, so we started like screen printing on things and doing tote bags and just trying to really, I don't want to throw anything away ever. And so I really do feel like we have this huge responsibility to be creative and figure out how to make it appealing so we can sell through everything that's sitting in our warehouse. It's really great. Um, I'm going to jump around the questions a little bit that are coming in. Uh, thank you. They're coming in quick. Uh, just to two related questions uh, to what you were just talking about. Um, Molly, again, great name. Uh, mm -hmm. Molly Hall asks, uh, do you take pieces from regional theater companies? And you did just discuss how the process of shipping works. So, our so Yeah, so we do take stuff from regional. Um, we have a, a lot of inventory from regional theaters. Here, I have some show and tell. Um, this is from The Importance of Being Earnest at the Old Globe. Um, and then all of our bags also have a little, they're all lined and they have a tag inside that says the show and like the number you have out of the collection, um, which makes it kind of like a fun keepsake. So we do, we accept stuff from uh, regional theaters all the time. Um, here. <laughs> this is the passport cover for our travel line we were going to launch this year. <laughs> will happen eventually um and yeah and it's always a little bit different sometimes if someone has like we we get a lot of um scraps or offcuts of, of something that was burnt by a light or caught on a scenic piece and ripped or something like that and so if it fits in a box we'll ship it in a box if it's big enough for a pallet then we'll palletize it and and freight carry it out figure out how to make some magic with it keep it keep it alive molly did that answer your question is that, do you have anything else? Uh, yes, my, I guess my other question with that would be, um, I might have missed this, you've already said it, I'm sorry. Uh, does shipping, how does, how do you cover the cost of shipping between, does the company, does like my company, for example, pay to, to ship it to wherever it's going? We ship to, how does, we, we, we pay all shipping. Wow. So okay. you say we have this stuff and like, if you can get it in a box, that's, great. If you don't have a box, we will send you a box. If you don't have a pallet, we will send you a pallet. And then, you know, we ask that you kind of throw everything in the box or on the pallet. And then we hire our trucks to go and pick it up from you and take it to Florida or to North Carolina. So you guys shouldn't, anyone um, gifting us any theatrical materials should not incur any cost at all. That's awesome. Thank you. Very cool. Um, Cass, following up on the question about the, the fabric that is hard to turn into bags, you sort of touched on that and turning into tote bags, but is there fabric that you have left over that you can't use and what happens with that? Yes, sadly, and we've started being more selective about what we collect. Um, the only thing that we have received that we have not been able to use is fabric that was painted, um, painted with multiple layers because as many of you know, a lot of times you'll reuse the same drop over and over again and just paint over it. Um, and so it uh, cracks, the paint cracks when you fold it. And so it, it wasn't usable because it, all the paint was falling off of it. Um, so that, so now we say that, you know, bend it, move it around to see if it's gonna crack. Um, Cause sadly that's not gonna be usable for what we do with it. Um, and the only thing that we have collected that I haven't figured out how to use, but I'm not throwing away because I know that I will figure it out is scrims. So if anyone has any ideas of how to use scrims, they're, they're very delicate. And so trying to figure out how to repurpose them is a little bit of a challenge, but I haven't given up on it. But that's the only other thing that we've received that I haven't been able to use yet. Jennifer? Any chance of using the scrim for face masks? Well, the thing with the face masks is that it's supposed to be 100% um, cotton tight weave, which is currently, and has to be able to be washed on hot because that's how you kill the germs. So unfortunately, actually none of the drops that we have fit that criteria. Um, I have actually reached out to a couple of costume shops and asking if they have um, remnants that fit the criteria if they if there's any because costume pieces they they would use something like that um, but 
I know. I wish. Also, the most of the scrims are kind of a, a looser weave, so I don't think it would do. I'm sitting in the inner layer, not the outside. And people are doing double face things. It would be worth at least finding out. Yeah, yeah. There are a lot of ideas for scrims already in the chat. In case you're wondering, um, I'm so excited. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Uh, Cass comes up with produce bags, Molly, yep, produce bags, travel bags, laundry washing bags, uh, cheesecloth, hairnets. Oh, guys, you are brilliant. Uh, I knew this group would come up with. I love it. Yeah. I know the so produce funny. bag is something I've thought about. They're, they're very, they tear very easily. The scrim, like I remember as a stage manager being like, don't touch the scrim, whatever you do. Like, that's the one thing that if it gets caught on a, a scenic piece, like it's toast. Um, so I'll have to do some like R and D with the durability of them because the produce bag is actually a great idea. Yeah. Uh, garden cloth is coming up. Mara suggests something in the garden. Jessica, garden. anyway, I'll leave this. I need, to talk, I need to talk offline with Mara about her gardening because I have a backyard yeah, now for the first here. time and I don't, I'm from New York. I don't know. This is great. <laughs> um, I'm going to go back to the top of the questions. And Susan, do you want to ask your question about uh, partnerships, theater partnerships? Yeah. Uh, hi, Jenny. I know we, we do a lot of work with you with Wicked. But my question is, we always send you stuff. And I don't think we actually bring stuff back from you, do we, that we then sell? Or do we? I think you give us some things that we sell at the flea market. But my real question was, do you do partnerships with shows and theaters to take what you've taken of theirs and let produce a line of things that they can sell to donors and to fans. We have, we have, we kind of, we, we've done all of the above. I try very hard to make sure that whatever we're offering one um, donor we is fair across the board. So that's kind of something that I always take into account. Um, but when Wicked reached out to us um, the first time, because we've actually received four different shipments from Wicked, which has been amazing. And um, thank you, everyone who's involved with Wicked. Um, but the first one came through the costume shop. And so I reached out, I, or I asked through them, like, could you please connect me with your general manager or someone so we can get permission? Because I always, I ask permission um, with GM's producers and the scene designers of every, every show that we repurpose. Um, to be able to credit the show. Uh, if they say no, we can still use the material, but it's just, we, we don't write the show title in it. Um, but anything on our website where the show is um, posted, we have permission to do so. Um, but with Wicked, our agreement, David Stone, the producer, asked that we just donate back 10% of whatever we make to Wicked to sell at the flea market. And so that is, they, they weren't, because I, I did offer, I was like, you can sell them at merch, but they have, their own merch agreement with their merch supplier. And so that was what they get. So Wicked gets a write off for 10% of its donation essentially through BCFA flea market. Um, we also have the same, we do the same thing with a couple of other shows. Um, so that's been popular for some of the Broadway producers. Some of the Broadway producers just, or GMs just say here, it's our trash, we don't want it it makes us feel good to know that it's, you know, not going into a landfill, carry on. Um, and then we, a lot of, some of our regional theaters have asked for some back. So I keep that 10% of what we make idea and give them back um, a, a, per, a percentage of whatever bags we make so that they can give them to donors or, or sell them in their, um, in their merch stands. And then, and, then be, and then above that, I, I'll sell them back at like a wholesale price. So they get a percentage for free of what we make and then they can buy back at a discount if they want more. Got it. Okay, thanks. Smart. Molly, you asked a similar question. Does that answer it or do you have follow-ups? Uh, nope, that's great. Thank you. Awesome. Great. All right, scrolling back through the questions. Uh, Chrissy, do you want to ask your question about uh, materials for donations? Sure. So um, for those who don't live in the New York area, who don't have access to organizations like Materials for the Arts, um, where would you recommend they look to upcycle their materials? That is a great question. And I wish that I had better answers for you. Um, 
I'm trying, like, as I hear, because people will suggest things to me that I will, I'm trying to, like, kind of keep a file in my Gmail account of options. Um, but I do think, I mean, maybe this is something the Broadway Green Alliance can work on, is some kind of a resource database of nonprofits like Materials for the Arts that exist out of New York. Because um, I, I want to think that they do, or they certainly should. Oh, you've talked about this. Excellent. Um, because that it is something that I would, I wish that I personally had that resource information to be able to refer people to. Um, and a quick Google search is not always, I mean, that's kind of like the only option we have right now, but it doesn't always yield. But like I lived in New York, I've been doing this for a while and, it, and I found materials for the arts through BGA and not, and Google did not help me <laughs> with that. Um, so I also, you know, this, who knows what will happen in the next five to 10 years. Um, but my husband and I, my husband is a general manager and we've spent many nights up talking about like the future of scenery and the future of his career and what we want to do. And it has, it has evolved or devolved into like, maybe if the, if the touchstone is reducing theatrical waste and introducing new generation to theater, if those are like really the two things that drive what we are doing. Maybe we open our own scene shop here in, we're in Houston, Texas, in Texas. And, you know, maybe we partner with waste management and we start a rental house and everyone can send us their drops and are done with it. And we charge part of the fee for renting them to anywhere. And I don't know, like, I feel like something like this, that needs to exist some kind of like go to for the theatrical world to be able to share. Um, but it's just, you know, it's, we're not a selfish industry, but we all operate in these mi little microcosms just because we don't have the bandwidth or finances to kind of see what else is happening in the world. Um, and I love that right now, sadly, you know, for, for very sad reasons, people are really talking to each other more than I think they ever have before. Theaters are talking to theaters. General managers all have a, a think tank group. Artist directors all have a think tank group. Like everyone is really, um, you know, hands across the water more than we ever have before. And I hope that we can take that into whatever this next chapter of theater looks like, because I think it'll be really beneficial. That's great. That was kind of a non <laughs> non well, I agree. <laughs> Um, I think that's great. And I will just to, to add on to the answer of that question, uh, shout out to our regional chapters who all have great resources. Um, Chicago, Atlanta, the Philadelphia website has resources. Um, so there are great regional hubs for those answers. And that is something that the BGA is working on, collecting those resources. And in the meantime, if you can't find the answers on the website, you can always reach out to us and we are happy to connect you and help you find what you're looking for. So. I will look at the chat after this and, and pull those as well, because it is, I, when, when people offer us stuff, I like to kind of give them the option of, you know, it can go here or it can, you know, if I can, if I can keep a drop alive on stage as long as possible, that's, that's actually my goal. My, you know, like, if you're going to throw it away, send it to us, like, don't throw it away. But if, if it can live, let it live. Absolutely, that's great. And meanwhile, there's countless resources building in the chat. So as usual, we leave these uh, sessions with a resource, uh, a plethora of resources from the chat and from all of you. So this is fantastic. All right, I am scrolling back up, pardon me, while I find my place again, um, because we have another fabulous question uh, from John. John, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Um, I'm with the Milwaukee Repertory Theater, and this is one thing that we've been talking a lot about is how we can be um, better stewards to our environment. And so I was, I was curious how you found these companies to partner with, because um, my side project is that I have a scene shop um, on the side. And so that's one thing that we've talked a lot about is um, building that kind of uh, reuse of materials. And so I wondered how you found the scene shop in North Carolina and the, um, the sewing shop in California to, to help you with this endeavor? Um, well, first off, that's awesome. Um, second, well, so this is a little bit of a story, but um, 
so we found our manufacturers in LA first. And then after the like giant order flux came in, they quickly bowed out and said that they weren't going to be able to keep up. Um, so I was grateful for their honesty, but also terrified. And then actually my husband's cousin has a manufacturing shop in Florida and they have a sew team, but they make fezes, like fraternal fezes. Um, super random. They're the last company in the States that make them. And um, they're, it's kind of a dying uh, industry. There are not a lot of miters, I think they are. Um, anyway, uh, and so I sent them a sample and they're like, yeah, we can make this. And they actually hired on after um, Hurricane Irene hired on two full-time seamstresses. So they ha well, have a team of four that, um, see that work on just scenery bags at their um, warehouse now. So that's been really cool to watch them be able to grow because of taking on what we're doing. And, um, but we, it, we really had to kind of all learn together. And so I have fez makers making handbags and set makers making jewelry and, you know, it's a super fun party, but the scene shop, it's TTS and um, they emailed me is how I found them. They emailed me and they said, we, uh, we know you're already doing stuff out of drops, but we have all this show deck like EPG that we're going to be tossing. Do you want to make something? And they, they pitched like the coasters idea. And, um, and so, and I just don't say no. I was like, yeah, great. Let's figure out how to, what we can make. Send me, talk me through your materials, send me some samples and we'll, we'll start planning. And so that's really since, since finding our first manufacturers in Florida, everything else has come just because people have reached out to us because people are starting to hear about what we're doing. Um, so I'm super grateful for that. I don't know if I'm muted. That's why. <laughs> Classic mistake. Um, great. Uh, we have a next. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you so much. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. And thank you for doing such great work there in Milwaukee, thinking that through. That's awesome. Um, Susan, uh, your, I have your next question here about uh, actors and jewelry. Do you want to ask that? Sure. I just wonder, Jennifer, there are a lot of actors that I've come across over the years design jewelry. A lot of them do them as side businesses. Have you thought at all about getting in touch with people to design some of your stuff? It would just be a cool way to employ actors during this time or get them involved with what you're doing. And especially if there's a connection with TDF or Broadway Cares or anything like that, it just might be an interesting idea. Yeah, I love that idea. And I if you know any actors who design jewelry, throw it in the chat. Um, I have actually one, I've reached out to a couple of costume designers to, to see if they wanted like design bags for us, or I am very open to the idea of partnering on design with people in the theater industry. Um, Cause currently I've designed everything by myself as a stage manager, non fashion designer, <laughs> and, you know, and it's going, it's going well, but the goal was always to bring on, you know, professionals to, from the theater world. You know, I really, I really uh, like the cyclicality of all of that. If we can kind of keep it as, as much in house as possible, um, it, it makes me happy. Um, I'll tell so, you, yeah. too, there are at least four on Wicked. There are at least four of them. I and mean, we, we do craft shows and I'm sure, and at Christmas, everybody trades what their crafts are. Yeah. So, so I, and I would think that would be true on a lot of shows. So Molly, that might be something we offer once, once I send these to Jennifer, maybe we offer green captains to find out who on their shows are also jewelry makers. I'm sure almost every show has at least one or two people. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be really cool, Jennifer, if you had them as your kind of guest designers for the month or something like that, there might be really a cool way to incorporate them into what you're doing. Yeah, I know. I, I love that idea. And we, you know, I've actually talked to a couple of, I'm, I'm also a member of the, the Broadway Makers Alliance, which are, um, they're mostly kind of in the fan world, but that they make things that are Broadway adjacent. Um, and, and usually the quantities we need are, are too high for like any one person to produce them themselves, but bringing them on as designers is a, is a great idea. Thank you for that. That's awesome. That's exciting. 
Uh, Charlie, uh, do you want to ask your question about the touring shows? Sure. Uh, unfortunately, right now, a lot of uh, touring shows are mm -hmm. deciding after having uh, kept them alive for some period, they're deciding that they're not going to end up going back out. So this week we've gotten, um, uh, I have a different non-LTL uh, trucking business and um, we're having a lot of shows uh, des designate what's left to shop returns and to a significant amount of disposal. So we, there's probably going to be 50, 53 foot trucks of um, scenic materials uh, as well as other things um, uh, doing returns in the next month. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so the, my question is about um, whether we point any of them in your direction, how much volume uh, how much volume could you take? You can think about this and um, yeah. respond on offline because we have still about 150, 53 foot trailers um, uh, in right now with show storage. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it's a very good question, and our our footprint is is not that big. <laughs> of, no, no, of it's it, it, it's a question um, of how much how much. Exactly. Uh, uh, I'm suspecting this is a moment where if you say how much you would like, how many truck, 53 foot truckloads of things you would like in the next three months, um, uh, they're available if uh, you let us know. Okay, thank you for that. And I, I have, um, I'm normally really good about reaching out to like the GMs of whatever shows are closing after like a respectful amount of time after announcing. And I haven't touched any of the COVID closure ones because I've just kind of been too sad about it. But watching it all go into a landfill would be insult to injury for sure. But, the, the, but they're also, they have to put it somewhere. Mm -hmm. So they're relatively, many of them are relatively indifferent where they, they direct the trucks. The, in most cases, truckloads right now of shows are wherever uh, they were um, uh, March 17th. Right. And um, they're going to be sent somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, they could just as easily be sent to North Carolina, Florida, some of them. Mm -hmm. uh, so just think about, um, think about what capacity and whether there's um, it, things to do on on some of them. some of them are great name shows some yeah. of them are less known shows yeah that's thank you for for saying that and i will i will talk to my shops and and, and see what their bandwidth is because it would be really sad to see all that just a suggestion charlie you should get her a list of which shows you're talking about and I think what would be the most helpful is to figure out how much of it is fabric, how much of it is, is not, you know, how much is drops. Because I think if those shows could separate out drops from the rest of the stuff they're getting rid of, that's going to help Jennifer rather than thinking about 150, 53 foot trucks. 150 of them aren't fabric. So yeah. I, I do think there's a way to, to separate out and to, so that she can kind of think about what could go where. Right. If if this uh, I agree, Susan. If the scale is, we could take five uh, fifty-three foot trucks of drops. Mm -hmm. That would be a conversation we could start uh, introducing to the TDs about um, whether they are able to separate it. Um, I think a lot of them would do it. There, right now, there's. It's very hard to get. Uh, cross loads or anything where you assemble a crew to do things. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the, uh, there are shows that are stacked up waiting to be able to go back to shops that are closed right now. So anything that they could do if they had, if one of their loads, if truck number th four is uh, all drops, 
they would probably love to send that one sooner. Well, and that would be great. I, I know in my experience, producers are, are not super excited to pay more money for sorting time um, for, for, for things like that. But if something were already, if, you know, sorted it, it, to some degree, that would be super helpful. So why don't we not take everybody's time, but if you great. want to think about what capacity and uh, contact me, the, these conversations are going on um, in real time. Fabulous. That's Thank awesome. you guys. All right, this is really lovely. Um, I'm gonna move on. Uh, Christy, you ask a question about permission, everything. Um, I do believe some of your questions have already been answered. Is there anything else you wanna ask or was any of your question not touched upon yet? I think that that addressed it. I, I just was curious, um, obviously with the set designers or any kind of marketing that it's involved. Um, you know, who, who, how many people do you have to run this by um, in order to make sure that you've covered all your bases? All, you know, it's a great, great idea, but I'm sure there are people that need to grant permission. So I was just sort of curious about, um, yeah. yeah, I think you, you more or less answered that question. So thank you. Well, this also is, I, I'm in many ways very grateful for my stage management background, but because of that, I knew the kind of the way, the way unions work, the way the theater community works is like, I needed to ask permission. Um, there's no kind of like ask for forgiveness afterwards. I knew that like this was very important to do this right. Um, and so I always, it depends, and some of the bigger shows like When Wicked was presented to us, I really, I asked a lot of people because um, I really wanted to make sure we had our bases covered. Um, and then, and some of the smaller shows, I like. I know if the GM is says that I we're good, and then I also send a separate email to the scenic designer, um, even though like most of them are work for hire and and don't really have a control, like ownership and control of their work after it's been done. Sadly, um, I still always loop them in and ask if I can credit them. And there's a designer page um, featuring highlighting all the scenic designers of the of material that we've upcycled um, on our website. So it's really Im important to me to not only get permission from the show, but I also get permission to credit the scenic designer and give them um, attention for, for their work as well. That's really smart and really beautiful and uh, just a nice tribute to the collaborative nature of our art form, even as we upcycle it, that everyone is still a part of it. That's just really special. Something yeah, can. and I, I've actually, I also offer them a piece of whatever we're making. And so I've sent back to a lot of scene designers, like a bag from one, one of their sets they made, which has been really fun. They're like, yeah, I'd love to have a piece of that. That's awesome. Um, so, so that's been actually a really cool kind of like, you know, side, side part of that. Fabulous. All right. I'm really excited to turn this over to Helen for a minute, uh, who is a college student with a great question. I, so I'm a college student. I go to UNC School of the Arts and a lot of my peers and myself are really interested in being more sustainable in our art and in our um, practice. So I was wondering if you had any suggestions for um, like the up and coming generation of theater artists and how we can work to be more sustainable. That is a great question. Also, my husband went to, well, it was NCSA back when he went, but UNCSA. Oh, nice. so that out. Um, he was the stage manager, Brandon Kahn. We do. Yes, awesome. That is an amazing program. I went to USC, got my BFA in stage management, and it was nowhere near as good of a program as UNCSA. So congratulations, you're in a good place. Um, and I am very excited and, and hopeful that all, all of this like next generation that's coming out of school is kind of hip to this idea. And I think that alone will be really helpful. I, I think hanging on to communicating with theaters around you and sharing, um, you know, like no man is an island, theater is a team sport. And I think that it's gonna be really important that we communicate with the people that we, outside of like the shipping sphere, like the people in your immediate uh, area, if you can share, if you can trade, if you can barter. Um, it's just about being able to reuse things and, and trying to create things out of 
more sustainable materials is also important. Um, and I'm hopeful that that will start being a slightly more cost effective than it is now. Um, you know, it's, I think one of the reasons why we don't use a lot of sustainable materials is because they're more expensive, but I think that uh, there's a tide shifting on that a little bit. Um, and so I think all of, all of those things combined will help immensely, but I think just going into it with the idea of how can we do this more sustainably is light years better than what we have been doing <laughs> for the last however many generations. Um, so I'm just glad that it's, it's something that's on your mind. Just to add to that, um, I, I think it's interesting. The most important thing I think is not just from a stage manager or a prop person or one person in the community, but it needs buy-in from everyone, you know, directors, designers, artistic, marketing to some degree. Um, and mostly because the thing that we're bumping our heads up against the wall um, often is that we have a designer who built something really cool that we could repurpose for our set this time you know that designer needs to be on board artistic needs to be okay with seeing it again and the director needs to you know you see what, where i'm going with this so um that's one thing that we're pushing for now of course like so many theaters being in not the best financial shape and how can we cut costs and this is one of the ways you know it's kind of like you know, a big throwback to the way we used to do things, like on a tighter budget. Mm -hmm. um, but we, but that doesn't mean that quality has to fall, too. You know, and just yes. pushing that fact because everyone will be like, "Oh, that means that it's not going to look as good." It's like, no, no, that's not true. We still have artistic sense. It's just we're going to reuse it, and make it, make it different, better. I I could not agree more, and I also am a firm believer in, you know having less can sometimes make a better show. You know, like every, how everyone talks about how one director was brilliant off Broadway when they had to get scrappy and then they were given a huge budget and it was terrible. And they had like a huge flop because there was just too much production and too much money. And sometimes you can do so much more with less. I, I am curious if there's some kind of, because I, I do think that the, the issue with a designer being frustrated when you reuse, I mean, it happens all the time. You reuse pieces of their set or you re reuse a costumer's work for one show in a bunch of other shows. You know, it's, it's, it's standard practice, but I, I don't know how we make that a, a happier situation for them. Like if it's part of, cause they're all, they're work for hire. They understand that this happens. Um, it's actually one of the reasons why they're usually shocked when I ask their permission you know, when I reach out to scene designers, they're, they're literally shot. They're like, wow, that's really nice of you. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Um, because one, they, they kind of have made peace with the fact that once they make something, it can be used however the theater wants for forever. Um, but I do think that's an important piece of the puzzle. And I agree that, uh, that everyone needs to, to buy in and, and, and work on, on that being a goal. Thank you. Uh, Mara here, can I add a little comment? Sure. Just, um, I'm remembering from our talk with Beth Malone last month, how early she st began her conversations with everyone. I feel like when being green, being more sustainable, figuring out the cradle to cradle operation of a whole season, when, when those conversations, as the early, Earlier, those conversations begin, the less conflict there is later, right? If you getting that buy-in from the beginning helps so much so that there is less confusion later because everyone knows. Just like on day one, day one meeting, getting everyone on the same page, then you all have a common goal in mind. And I think that that can happen um, within the college setting. Absolutely. You know, when you're if you email your professors before the school year starts or, or, you know, talk to them on the first day and say, I'd love to just, you know, kind of focus our semester with, within this framework, it can get lay, lay good groundwork for the whole year. Great. Thank you. Um, I'll just add in, first of all, Helen, congratulations on thinking about this and thinking about this in college. Um, and 
you know, I think you're doing a fabulous thing by attending this, attending this in, you know, towards the end of the semester, after your semester is over, I've lost track of all days, but, um, you know, and joining, you know, and that's to everyone here. My favorite, um, one of my favorite parts of the BGA is one of our core principles, which is it's impossible to be green. You can only be greener, right? You know, there's no such, there's no perfect green person that's a myth. You know, we always joke except for Elphaba or Kermit. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just impossible. But you can be a little bit greener today than you were yesterday. And all of us have already accomplished that by showing up right here for this webinar, taking time out of our day to think about being green, think about being green together, and coming together in a time where that feels truly impossible. Um, so I applaud you. I applaud you for doing that and asking these great questions. Um, one thing to think about is that we have a college green captain program, which is a mirror to our uh, Broadway green captain program, our regional green captain program, our touring program. Um, so I encourage you to think about that. And it's doable, even remote, as we see here today. Um, so. I'm looking at trying to start one, uh, but no one wants to be my faculty sponsor. But I think once we get back, they'll all be on board with starting a club with me. Excellent. And if you need help and support with that, reach out. We can certainly back you up and have those conversations alongside you. Thank you. Yep. So. I'm happy to get my husband in the loop too and tell him to talk to his his old teachers and get him on board. That would be cool. Thanks. Perfect. And whoever's involved with USITT there, um, and that might also be a good lead. Oh, uh, yeah. Awesome. I, I don't ask them because they're already like doing USITT, but that's that's a good step. I, it, I will ask them. And it's talk. considered a, a, a um, US ITT activity also. Oh. So. Oh, no, I didn't. There you go. So those are some great next steps. Thank you to all of you for... Thanks, everyone. Great. Um, I see we have one. It looks like we have time at least for one more question here. Um, Ariana, and then I'm gonna, this is a question, Susan, you have a lot of expertise on. So Ariana, do you wanna ask it? And I'll let Susan jump in on it too. Uh, hi, so I am sort of new to the professional theater world and uh, it's kind of just, it's sad to see at the end of every show, uh, we order like a 40 foot dumpster and just put everything in there and that's, and we're done with it. Um, so I'm wondering, how like what are some ways to start having conversations about producing less waste with uh, technical directors and like production managers and those people? I love the question, Ariana, and I'm glad you you've asked it. Um, it's really part of the way the BGA started was was when we saw these dumpsters filling up and saying, what can we do? Um, one of the things, we haven't quite finished this yet. We're working on a program called Closing Green that will hopefully help shows throw less into dumpsters. But what I was gonna suggest to your question is, one of the principles of that is to start having a conversation with the tech directors at the end of tech. So right when the show opens, if there could be a discussion then before they leave the show, of a final thing of when the show is going to close, what are we going to do with the physical production so that they can actually make a plan. As they're, that, That's the point during tech where they're the most familiar with everything that exists on the show and what if the stuff is rented and what if the stuff was bought and what can be reused and what's the future of the show is their storage. So if that conversation can happen, not at the close of the show, but at the opening of the show, it's a good point for them to have a plan in place of either plan A, plan B, depending on what's gonna happen in the future, but to have that discussion with the tech director of what are we gonna do with this when it's done. So that's what I would suggest is try to do that early. Don't wait for the end, do it at the beginning. Not when they're in the middle of tech, but once they've got the show loaded in, teched, done, and before they disappear and work on their next project. Great. Charlie, did you want to add? I, I just want to add, uh, I think what Susan said is the most important thing. Uh, we uh, did an off-Broadway town hall about closing green, and we have materials, uh, a kit about that, that um, we'll send to everyone 
uh, on this uh, on this call. It identified five major obstacles, including timing, as Susan talked about, storage, cost, um, uh, uh, inform information, etc. But uh, the biggest obstacle, as people talked about it, or the key thing is, as Susan said. Um, the convert it's too late if you're having the conversation about what to do when you're closing and everybody's doing it. It has to, you have to have that conversation earlier to be uh, effective, but we'll send that kit out to everybody. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I am aware of time. We have a lot of stage managers on this call, so I cannot let us run over. <laughs> We're getting a lot of trouble. Uh, so Jen, just with the last minute or two, I don't know if you have any final words or advice for people, especially as people start to think about, you know, creatively upcycling or, or looking at strike. Um, any last things you want to share? I'm just, I'm so grateful that think tanks like this exist and that the BGA exists. And this is so important. I think it's really like the our only big misstep as an industry is what we're doing to the planet because I think everything else we're providing the world is so valuable, uh, maybe now more than ever. Um, so I am I am hopeful that as in nineteen after the nineteen eighteen flu pandemic, it ushered in the Roaring Twenties and the Golden Age of musical theater. That we are you know a few steps behind having a resurgence and another Golden Age of theater, and that. You know, it's scary now, but I think that we are in a really important time right now that moving into the next chapter, we set new rules and we set new boundaries and that we can kind of step into a second golden age of theater in a, in a way that we're being kinder to our, our planet. And I think that that's, now is the time to kind of restructure in a way that can be really valuable in doing all of the, the above. Absolutely. Cheers to that. Well, thank you so much for spending this hour with us and for sharing your story and your insights. It was absolutely wonderful. Um, I speak to everyone in the chat who is saying the same. And um, thank you all of you for again, spending your hour with us. Uh, we hope to see you next week for a very exciting Compost 101, prepared to get, you know, virtually dirty with the compost <laughs> and uh and after that for all of you stage managers on this we'll see you again in two weeks for a fabulous all-star stage management lineup about sustainable stage management uh so thank you guys enjoy the rest of your thursday and we'll see you next week um, thank you bye everyone <laughs>